Hello friends, welcome back to Penny for the Soul. You will wonder why I am showing you my running shoes. But uh, that is because the story today is on running. Uh, you're going to meet, uh, shortly you're going to meet uh, Soini Chattopadhyay, the young journalist um, who's written the book, The Day I Became a Runner. And uh, this in this wonderful book, she has um, written about uh, uh, women's history of India through the lens of sport. You know, it's it's a very fascinating book. And without much ado, let's go and meet her. So, uh, hi, Soini. Uh, Soini. Uh, thank you for giving, uh, you know, Fanny for the Soul some time with your interview. Hearty congrats on uh, the release of your book at uh, Goa Literature, uh, uh, Arts and Literature Festival. Very quickly, Soini, why, uh, how did you think of even getting down to writing this book? Hi, Rahul. Thank you for having me. Uh, just holding up the book one more time to say that this uh, line running through the middle of the cover, Women's History of India Through the Lens of Sport, that is also partially the answer to your question. How did I come to this point, to this line? Uh, I, came, uh, uh, I came to running uh, through grief. So um, I thought running, grief felt heavy. So I thought running would help dislodge it. Uh, and uh, once the haze of grief started to lift, uh, I noticed that uh, I was a bit of an anomaly. I'm talking about, uh, say, uh, 2008, so uh, more than 15 years from now, um, when um, I was running, I was living then in Delhi, I was running in what I call semi-public parks because these are parks inside DDA uh, gated colonies. So I would run in those colonies, occasionally step out of the colonies and run on the roads of Delhi and I began to realize that a woman running is an anomaly um, but this was a first for me I realized I didn't belong in uh, or I didn't belong as comfortably as I belonged in all other spaces in public space so that was the uh, beginning of my inquiry that why what is this relationship um, between public space and citizenship. Why am I not as welcome here as I am in other places? Wonderful. Uh, tell us a little about the the uh, the way you went about researching for the book. You know. Sure. It took me eight and a half years to write this book. Um, most serious nonfiction takes uh, research. Having said that, I would say that. Uh, we live in a golden age of research in a way because of the internet which makes a, things a lot easier. Um, from the beginning of my project, I thought of this as an India book. I wanted to tell a story of India through the lives of women athletes. So through this, uh, looked at the big names across decades. So some obviously, you know, I leap at you, I'm an 80s kid. Uh, I was born in the 80s, that means, so uh, Usha obviously leaps at uh, so someone from my generation, but actually also later generations, so she's an iconic sportswoman. Uh, but, so some of this research, how did I do this research, how did I come to finalize these athletes, so some of it on the internet, and then much of my research, so I would say 70% of my research is done out of newspaper archives, and after that, once I drew up a list of uh, the athletes I wanted to speak with and then getting in touch with, so that's where my journalistic skills really came in uh, very useful. And I, I see this as a work of, you know, at least 50% of it is a work of reportage. So uh, then I uh, got in touch with the athletes and I, I did interviews. So I spent at least seven days, usually seven to ten days with each athlete being with them, uh, doing uh, structured and unstructured interviews. So I would go with some questions, but um, the idea of spending time with them was to so also to listen and respond to what they were saying. So it's not just structured questions. So that's what my research process was like. So initial outlining to with the internet, lots of research on the on, on newspaper archives. Uh, and then uh, interviews. And the newspaper archives really fed into the interviews in the sense that um, 
I would look at, I would note down things like what was the weather like on 7th August 1984, 8th August 1984. Those were the days of Usha's heat and then the 400 meter hurdles final. So uh, Usha actually, of course, I mean, she's not that old, so she remembers very well, but with some of the older athletes, uh, these details really helped. Like, uh, what was the weather like in 1952, Helsinki? Uh, it was an unusually hot summer in Europe that year. So, although Mary D'Souza, who was part of the first Indian team to send women to the Olympics at the 52 Games, was very sharp when I met her and had a very good memory. But these things uh, sort of help you, help bring other things back. Hmm. Because for someone like Mary, I was talking about something that happened 65, 66 years ago. Hmm. So these are great aids. So that was my process of research. Wonderful. So, uh, can you tell us some, uh, you spent uh, almost a week with many of these athletes. So, tell us a little about the time you spent with Usha, because he's such an icon. At least a week, yeah, yeah. So, with Usha, who was, who, who was very busy, as, as I met her in 2019. And she's, of course, today she's busier, because she's, a, uh, she's an MP and she has official roles. But even then, she's a very busy person, because she runs a fantastic... Uh, school of Athletics for the Usha School of Athletics at Pyrori. Uh, so I spent a week with her. Uh, it was both easy and difficult because Usha is very used to dealing with the media. So she was very professional in the sense that when you email her, uh, you will get a response in 24 to 48 hours. So that's, that way is very professional. Um, so I didn't have to keep looking for her. But she kept changing dates because she, because she's busy. Mm. It's, it wasn't to make life difficult. So I had to change my tickets three times. And, and eventually she relented because she was like, oh, you have changed your ticket three times. So uh, I now owe you. So that was uh, how what it was like to get to Usha. <laughs> she's in person, I feel, very funny, intentionally and unintentionally. Because she's very strict. So she... Uh, she, she, and, and she doesn't mince words so it was fun it was fun and she said uh, things that I feel like like if anybody else uh, said I would think this person is pompous or smug but with Usha partially because she's such an icon uh, to people like me people of my generation and partially because it's, that's her persona and she owns it she's such a boss woman uh, I didn't mind it at all but uh, she is quite uh, a disciplinarian and, and she's very, she, she, I won't say she snaps, but she, she speaks on what's on her mind and she told me, you know, what is this project, why are you wasting so much of time, why seven days to do it quickly? So as I say, as I see it, it's like somebody who knows the value of one hundredth of a second. In the book, you have even focused on uh, your maternal grandmother, your mum and you. You know, so can you tell us about what is it uh, you know that readers can look forward to about? So I say my book has two threads of history. One is the relatively public thread of the relatively well-known athletes. So I'm telling a story of India from the late 1930s to this moment through the lives of nine women athletes. So that is the more public thread. The second thread is a private thread of family history. So I'm also telling the story of India from the late 1930s to this moment through the life of my maternal grandmother, my mother and me. And I thought of this, when I thought of it, I was very excited that I will have two threads in the book. Uh, and I thought of it as an experiment. I wasn't sure about it. I'm still not sure. It depends on, uh, you know, readers, what they make of it. But to me, this was the more novelistic so novelists typically do often say that, I, I say that my book is a narrative in the forest gum template. And, but you tell the story of a nation through one person or through one family. That's what forest gum does. It tells the story of America from the 50s to post-Vietnam and a little bit more through uh, forest and his family and his near and dear ones. So that was the attempt to marry uh, you know, non-fiction historical research with a more novelistic approach. Also, 
also so nothing that I see about my grandmother or mother and niece uh, made up or creative, but it was a marriage of two kinds of uh, writing, non-fiction and a fiction, fictional device of you know telling using the family to tell a story. Wonderful. So, so, uh, so, so, Ani, thank you so much for the time you have spent, uh, you know, giving us this interview. And I urge everyone to go and pick up this book. <laughs> okay, thank you.